modeling, which is the topic of, of tonight's conversation. Last week we did intro to financial modeling, and it's really just the concepts you have to understand. It's not, it's not like you need to run spreadsheets or build spreadsheets to do this. I've done that for you. And um, I'm in the process of, of wiring what I showed you up last week. So, so I can take that, that client input data and, and just cut and paste it into the, the spreadsheet. Um, now, it's not going very smoothly, as, I, as, I, as I, you probably appreciate. It's, uh, it's harder than it sounds, but I will get there. And I'm hoping by next week, I will have a, uh, at least a, a first draft of what that energy model would look like for each of your clients. Uh, based off the data you've you've given me, uh, hang on. There's more people in the waiting room. Here we go. Dorothea, Fred, and Cindy. We have a quorum. Hello, hi, Fred. Is that Cindy? Yes, hello, yes, Cindy and Dorothea. Hi. hi. So we have everyone. That's great. Thank you. All right, so I was just going over the, um, the, the things I sent out, the cost estimation uh, document and the energy modeling one. Uh, I think we've now, everyone now has it. Is that right? If anyone doesn't have it, stick your hand up. Dorothea. What, what, no, no, sorry. I just adjusted my light. Oh, okay. so <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're much better now, Dorothea. So Katie, what, what do you not have? Cost estimate. Okay. Okay, I will resend that. Um, right at the end we don't really need it during this meeting because that's really like the rules of thumb uh, that, that, that will allow you to get a rough estimate of what a heat pump or water tank is going to cost you or cost a client or what a what a um an air source heat pump is going to cost or what a solar panel is going to cost it's, it's just a rough estimate i use all these numbers these are the same numbers that are baked into the spreadsheet so when you use these as rough calculations they're used in the same spreadsheet calculations when when doing the energy modeling um, but energy modeling really is the, the topic of conversation tonight. We, we, we started last week with the financial modeling and introduced the concept of discounted cash flow. A dollar in a year's time is worth less than a dollar today. To put them all on apples to apples basis, we discount that future payment to today's value. So if you've got $100 in a year's time, maybe worth $95 today. And then we can evaluate everything on an apples to apples basis. And then the rules we came up with at the end, which is standard out of every finance textbook, is if you've got a bunch of different investment opportunities, you do all the ones with the um, net present value that's positive, and you don't do anything if the net present value is negative. That's the first rule that helps us to sort through the, the, the bewildering array of options. And then the second one is among those that have the positive IRR, you do the one, sorry, with the positive net present value, you do the one with the highest IRR first. Because that's the best bang for the buck. You'll save the most money, get the best return on investment, and then you go to the next one in order. That's sort of the conventional wisdom on, on, on how to use financial modeling. Hey, Cindy? Hi. Um, could I ask Katie to please mute while she's not talking? Because I'm getting feedback, and it's interrupting you talking, David. Thank you. OK. Um, so that, those are sort of the, the, the basic rules um, from, from finance and investment. But, but today, we're changing topics a little bit to the other half of modeling, which is the energy modeling, not the financial modeling, because we need to model the energy inputs, uh, the energy consumption in the house, in order to build a financial model. Because the, the, key, the key connection between those two, that sort of the, that links the two together, is the money you save by doing the investment. Because it's pretty easy to calculate or find out what the money is going to cost you. You get a quote. You get a quote for solar panels, you get a quote for a heat pump, you get a quote for triple glazed windows, you know what it's going to cost you. The big unknown, which no contract will ever tell you, not in my experience anyway, is how much you're going to save. So that's the number we need to get at, is how much can we save, or at least get an estimate of it, how much can we save by adding triple glazed windows, by adding solar panels, etc. And that is the purpose of the energy model. Um, so did, did everyone, so everyone I think got the energy model document, did it make sense? Did anyone, did, they say, did anyone not make, not make sense? Did anyone, anyone confused or not clear? Just raise your hand if you can. It's not, this isn't a test, it's not a problem. <laughs> um, um, so so let, let, me just, let me just sort of double check then. Um, so how do we think about, what are, the, what are the important things we need to think about when we're, when we're trying to calculate the energy loss from a home? 
Anyone can jump in. Doesn't matter. Not grading anyone. Not a test. Yeah, Karen? Number and size of windows. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and why do we do that, Karen? Because that's the biggest area that you lose heat out of your house. So that would be the area rate of heat loss equation, which equals area times temperature difference. That's the area. Yep, so you're exactly right. The area matters. And we pair off the area with the R value of that thing. So that is a window, it's the R value of the window or the U factor, just one is just the opposite of the other. Um, and we sort of pair them off. We multiply the area by the, the U factor or divide it by the R value. Um, so we can calculate how much heat is flowing out through that window. Uh, what else do we need to measure? Everything in the envelope. So, <laughs> right? so Scott's right. That's like the, the 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 one the one the one answer that answers them all is everything in the envelope, right? So everything around your house, everything on the outside. That means the bottom, the basement, the top, the attic, the four walls, and all the windows. Now you could, if you want to be really picky, go for the doors as well, but they're starting to get small compared to those other things. And remember, we do not need to be a hundred percent accurate with this. We just need to be accurate enough that we can say how much we'd like you to save by say installing triple glazed windows instead of double glazed windows. Um, so, so, so those first two are right, the, the area and the insulation, either the U factor or the, the R value. What else are we missing? Air infiltration? Uh, we are missing air infiltration. And in fact, in, in the first generation model I built, Scott, I made no allowance for air infiltration. Um, and that is an, uh, like an inaccuracy in the model. In later generations, I have specifically allowed for it. So if you have a blower door test, I can incorporate that directly. If you don't, I just kind of guess at it based off what people say is leaky in their house, how drafty it is, and based off the age of the construction as well. Older houses mm -hmm. tend to be more leaky than the more modern houses. But that, that can be a guess, or it can be, um, if someone has the data on the air changes per hour, or the flow rate in cubic mm -hmm. feet per minute, then I can input that directly. Um, but we're still missing one big one, guys. Dave, uh, David, um, the temperate differentiation. Exactly. Differentiation temperate. between yeah. inside and outside. Yeah, and so so this this may be obvious, but I'm a physicist, so stuff that's obvious to me is, isn't always obvious to everyone else. That the, the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is a big determinant of how fast heat flows out of your house. And the faster heat flows out, the more you've got to put back in to keep it at the same temperature. You have to replace that lost heat. Every time heat leaves your house, energy leaves your house, you have to burn a fossil fuel or turn on an electric fan heater to replace the heat or your temperature will go down. So to maintain a house that's say 70 degrees or 72 degrees or 65 degrees, you have to replace the amount of heat that's being lost by the house. And the amount of heat that's being lost increases in proportion to the um, the surface area of the house or the windows, could be the walls or the windows, but as the surface area gets bigger, the rate of heat loss goes up. As the insulation gets better, the rate of heat loss goes down. And as the temperature difference between the inside and outside goes up, then the rate of heat loss goes down. So let me imagine it's a beautiful spring day in May and the outside temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the inside temperature is set to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the rate of heat loss from the house? You have equilibrium, so there is no heat loss. Right, I got it in stereo, tri I got it in triple stereo there. Uh, mm. Colleen, you're looking a little bit baffled. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, I'm good. It does, okay, great, great. Uh, so I think, I think you've all yeah. got the concepts. Are, yeah, Fred? Well, just one simple experiment you could do is take a, for your freezer, take a very cold set of water into a uh, ice cube tray and a very hot set of water into an ice cube tray, put them in your freezer, they freeze at the same time because the differential between the hot and the cold is so big that the height goes away very quickly and they both get to 32 at the same moment. I like to try that. <laughs> an experiment you can all try at home, right? <laughs> all right. Um, so, but, but if you've got that concept, that is the major thing you've got to get, that 
the, the rate of heat loss, which, which is equal to dollars, because you have to put it back in again as heat from burning in a fossil fuel furnace or burning, burning electricity, that's dollars. That's your money that's going in, the energy that's going in, and that is going to go down if the insulation goes up. It's going to go down if the area goes down, uh, the area of the windows or the area of the walls goes down, and it's going to go up with the difference in temperature between the inside and the outside. Okay, so that's the... That's the conceptually, that's the key thing. Um, so then just we, how we measure this stuff, uh, we measure um, heat is generally measured in America in BTUs or British thermal units. Um, it's like nobody else on the planet measures heat in BTUs. It's like, it's, it's a totally American thing. Nobody in Europe or Japan or the rest of the world measures uh, heat in BTUs, but America does. So that's, that's, that's the, the language we speak here. So we've got to speak that to, to all of our clients. You, you don't need to know this stuff. I think this is really beyond what any of your uh, clients are likely to know, but they may talk about BTUs. They may have heard, like, say, a, a heat pump, maybe 50,000 BTUs per hour. They, they may have heard stuff like that from contractors. Um, and uh, so you should at least be familiar with the term. So heat is measured in BTUs. That's the unit of energy. Um, so, David, let me get this straight. You mean the British don't use BTUs? Correct. They used to until the 1970s when, um, sorry, 1980s when Margaret Thatcher abolished the imperial units, the units that ran the British Empire for two centuries, abolished them and replaced them with metric. So if you, if you go to Britain and you buy um, gasoline these days, it is no longer sold in gallons. It is sold in liters. Mm -hmm. If you go to a doctor's office and you get weighed, you're weighed in kilograms. Your, measure, your height is measured in meters. It used to be feet and inches and pounds. And I, I grew up on that. I, I lived through the transition. But, but here we're still on the imperial system. And it's uh, BTUs is, is what people use. There is an alternative. Does anyone know what the alternative that is more, reasonably widely used as a measure of energy is? Uh, therms. Uh, therms is also used. Yep, therms is used almost yeah. only for natural gas. It's a right. it's a strange thing, but like natural gas is its own unit, but a therm is a unit of energy. You're exactly right, Dorothy. Mm -hmm. There's one other, there's three. There's therms, there's BTUs, and there's a third one. Well, everything can be translated into kilowatt hours. Yep. It's doable. Yep. So Dorothea has the German background, and so she speaks metric. And the kilowatt hour is the metric unit of, well, it's kind of metric, it's not really the metric unit, but it's a kind of metric unit for energy, just like the imperial unit is BTUs, just that's like Fahrenheit and centigrade, okay? Fahrenheit is the uh, American unit or the imperial unit, and centigrade is the metric unit, same thing. Kilowatt hours is just the metric unit for energy, um, and then BTUs is the imperial unit for energy, just like Fahrenheit, and... Um, Therms is an opal one that is only used for natural gas and for nothing else. Uh, but but Dorothy is exactly right. You can translate them all. There's numbers you can look up. I can tell you if you want, but you don't need to know. All you need to know is each of those is a unit of energy. And so when we talk about the rate of heat loss from a house, it's BTUs per hour or BTUs per day or BTUs per year. It's energy over a period of time is the, um, the rate at which heat, heat is lost from a house. And... <clears throat> So that'll be measured in BTUs per hour. And I'll give a little example here. If we've got a window, triple glazed window, R4, that's, um, so our downstairs windows are triple glazed and they are R4 windows. Um, and the window is 10 square feet. Um, and it's a 40 degree difference between inside and outside. 10 square feet multiplied by 40 degrees divided by R4 is 100 BTUs, 100 BTUs per hour. Um, so so that, that's, you don't really need to do these calculations. I'm just telling you that's how you do the calculation, so you're familiar with it. Um, and then I, I give you a couple of examples of how many BTUs I'm losing in my house. And the numbers start to add up really quickly. It is not uncommon for the number of BTUs when you're talking about a house being the millions, or even tens of millions of BTUs. If you're talking about how much heat does your house lose per year, you don't want to have a wild guess on what is a typical heat loss from a house in a year in BTUs. It's about 100 million. I mean, give it, it, could, you know, it could be 50 million on a, on a very well insulated house, could be 150 million on a badly insulated house. But it's, it's that kind of order, it's 100 million. So it's a lot of, of BTUs. Um, and in terms of kilowatt hours, you can, if you want to, you can translate BTUs to kilowatt hours. You divide by 3,412. Now, you don't need to do that. 
but that's just if you want like a rule of thumb, just take a third. So if you're if you're if you've got about a million, so 100 million BTUs per year, then it's about uh, 30,000 uh, 30, kilowatt hours. So just divide, take a third, Three, 300 million. Remember I said kilowatt hours. There's a there's a there's a kilo in there. Um, so so that does If you need to, if you need a rule of thumb, that's it. Just divide by divide by 3,000. So a third and then 1,000. Um, And, and then I, I give an example of well, how much that costs me because the easiest way to understand all this stuff I've found with homeowners is to translate it all to money because mm -hmm. BTUs go right over people's heads. They have really no idea what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's confusing to almost everyone. Um, and I've found there's, there's very little upside in trying to explain it. But translate it to money and everyone understands all of a sudden. And so I give an example here um, that it cost me about, before the Fab Four, my heating bill was about $38 a day in wintertime. Now, I know some of you, I've seen some of your spreadsheets, some of you are spending even more than I used to. It's unbelievable what you guys have got in your houses. Now, some of you are doing much better, and yeah, but we'll, we'll get to all this. This is great. We've got some really good examples. Right? We've got examples all over the map. From um, from you guys, that's, that's great. We'll have a, a lot of. Um, uh, it's gonna be very interesting to, to figure it all out. Um, but uh, one one sort of one way you can make this make a lot of sense to people is just to calculate how many dollars it is per day or or, or per year or per week because that's more how people think. People the most the most the most common way I have found clients express their energy bills is per month. They say, my electric bill is $200 a month. That's something people actually know about. Some people can tell you how much per kilowatt hour, but not very many. It's not written on your bill. Um, this, is, this is one of Eversource's ruses to try to make you not realize how much you're paying for it, is they never tell you how much it is per kilowatt hour. They give you like 18 line items of the recovery charge and the taxes. And mm -hmm. the you can't figure it out. They never tell you what it is, but they do tell you it's 200 bucks a month. So that, that number is, is sort of, the electric bill per month is widely known. And in the heating season, people tend to know what they, their, um, their heating oil bill is. Uh, most people here are on, on heating oil, some are on natural gas, but most people know, is, you know it's 400 bucks a month, or it's 500 bucks a month or 600 bucks a month um, for, their, for their, their heating bill. And that's what I find if you translate um, all of these things into cost, how much money it is per day or per month, then people start to say, ah, I recognize those numbers. And so this example I gave is thirty-eight dollars a day, so around a thousand dollars a month during the winter heating season. That is what my uh, heating oil bill used to be: thousand dollars a month during the the winter season. And my electric bill was I don't know three hundred bucks a month, something like that. Um, and uh, it's now, sorry, this is completely crazy. It's so much money. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and you know what, Dorothea? I had no idea. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea and until I started actually digging into it, like how much am I actually spending? I had no idea how much I was spending because it's just the utility bill. I just paid it every month. I didn't mm -hmm. even think about it. It was just whatever we needed to stay warm and, and keep the lights on until I investigated. And once I investigated, I realized just how much money I was spending. And, and I very rapidly realized I was wasting so much money on on heating fuel. This is before I even started to think about carbon footprints and pollution or other stuff. It's just so much money that I was spending on um, on, on heating fuel and, and in our case, a lot on electricity as well. Um, I was feeling so good about the insulation in the ceiling of my basement until I did your spreadsheet. <laughs> I just remind me, Karen, what do you have? What do you mean? What do you have in the ceiling of a basement? No, we have we have decent insulation, and then the the pipes have the insulating covers over them, and the um, ducts are wrapped. And I was like, "Woo, I'm, oh. I'm good." And then <laughs> then I dug into my bills and whatnot. But anyways, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but but you're better off than you would if you didn't. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, getting it to zero is a fair amount of work. Now it's very possible. I've done it. Um, and I'm, I'm working with other clients in, in Dover who are on, on the way there. They're not there yet, but they're on the way there. They're, they're going to get there. 
Um, but one of the things I say to, to clients is zero is an arbitrary number. It's a great thing to aim for. And if it's good for your family, if you can get there with your family, great. By all means, go and do it. But I don't think people should be getting stressed out about have I cut my carbon footprint 70% or 80% or 90%. 100% is great, but if you can catch your carbon footprint 60%, that's a big deal. That's a huge victory for everyone, for your family. You'll have less uh, asthma in the family. You'll have um, far cheaper bills, and you'll have um, less carbon pollution for the planet. So um, I, I don't believe we all need to be at zero. It's just we need to make a big, big savings, um, and and doing that in the way that is is best for your family, um, not not looking at the neighbors and saying, well, they got to zero, why aren't, why aren't I at zero? This is not necessary, just focus on doing what can be done for that family at that time. Um, so is there any other questions on the energy modeling? Well, I, I think you make a really good point that it's not about getting to zero, it's getting to less. Yeah. And, and so with all our clients, you know, if they think I have to get to zero, I can't do that. That's a uh, false equivalent. You know, I, I, I definitely agree with you, Fred. That's what I believe. Now, I've met other people who are perfectionists and they say, no, you're wrong, David. It's, uh, it's zero. Like we, we are on a mission to get to net zero here and we need everyone to get to zero. So um, there, there is a range of opinions out there as to, to what is the right thing. But my opinion is you, you need to do what was right for you and your family and don't obsess about what other people are doing. Do the right thing for you and your family. You do what you can do. Exactly, Scott. Do what you can do to make sense for you, what's reasonable for you. Uh, that's, that's what I believe. But, but I tell you, there's a range of opinions out there about how to do this stuff. And I, I'm not the only one um, who has an opinion. Well, David, it looks pretty sound to me. What I thought was interesting is on page three, where you say, how do we know the, if the model is right? So it's energy in, energy out, right? I mean, that's the basic premise. Yep. Um, so we're trying to cut down on our energy consumption, but you have some things like uh, the production of domestic hot water that needs to be taken into account if you're gonna use uh, your kilowatt hours input as compared to your estimate of heat loss. <clears throat> so I, that's an accounting exercise, but I think that's an important paragraph conceptually for, especially if you're speaking with a client who has concerns about the accuracy of what you're presenting. Did, did everyone follow that? What Scott was trying to say? No, Katie's saying no, Karen's saying no. So, so I think, so Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what Scott's trying to say is when you heat your domestic hot water, you're using, let's say, natural gas. You're, you're heating that domestic mm -hmm. hot water for your uh, sinks, showers, and stuff. But then the hot water is leaving the house down the drain. That energy comes into the house, but it kind of leaves the house. And if it just goes into your sewer or septic system, it's not that, that heat is not ending up in your house. And, and Scott, I think, is, is right, although I do think it's partly right. When you have a shower, a lot of that heat coming out of the hot water is actually going into the air in the house. With the, with the with the moisture, so at least some of it goes into the house. But Scott is right. This this energy modeling is not a hundred percent accurate. There are well known things that are missed out in this um, in this energy model, including things like solar heat gain. We all know that on a sunny day in the winter time, the sun is low in the sky, the kitchen gets nice and warm through the windows. Um, there is no accounting for solar heat gain in the energy model, and the reason I'm confident doing that is because when I started doing all of this. Uh, I just started by uh, recording the data for how much energy was used in my house from heating oil and electricity each day for two years. Uh, and I already did do this. I got a spreadsheet with you know, seven or 800 lines in it of, of um, daily heating oil consumption and electricity use. And I just correlated, I just drew a line graph of how that went with the number of heating degree days for that day. And heating degree days is, is just for every, you get one heating degree day for every uh, day, each day for each one degree Fahrenheit that the temperature is below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the average temperature of the day is 55, it's sort of a, a, a spring day, if the average temperature is 55 degrees, you have 10 heating degree days for that day. 
And that was all I did. I just correlated. I drew a line graph along one side, heating degree days and on the other side, the energy use in my house. And that's what gave me that 80% R-squared correlation. Now, that's a statistical term. You don't need to understand it, but just 80% is really good. It's very unusual in my experience. I've done lots of these graphs to, to find that higher correlation between just two things. When we know, as Scott said, we know we're not accounting for the hot water properly. We know we're not accounting for solar heat gain. We know we're not accounting for the heat that all of us give off. All of us give off heat just by being in the house. We're not accounting for any of that stuff. And yet to get 80% R squared, that's all in the 20%. All those things I just mentioned is in the 20% that's not in the 80% that I captured using only electricity and heating oil. And 80% is good enough to make decisions. That's, that's really the, the, the key insight, Scott. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be good enough to be able to make proper financial decisions that aren't predictions. I'm not, not telling anyone the energy model says you're going to save $492.84 next year. It's going to allow you to rank and prioritize different actions. Mm -hmm. And the prediction is not 100%, because it's going to give you the right kind of ballpark and the right kind of prioritization among the different actions you'll be considering for those clients. That's why it's a useful tool. But as, as you say, Scott, it's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be yeah. good. Um, did anyone, did anyone, was anyone confused by this, this idea, which Scott does point out is, is, is kind of fundamental, that energy in equals energy out? Is that okay with everyone? Because Scott is mm -hmm. right, that is, that is kind of fundamental. And if you go into the laws of physics, it's bedrock. It's like, you, you can dig down. This is the laws of thermodynamics at the most basic level. Like you can't exceed the speed of light. You can't get, get around the second law of thermodynamics. And, and this is the second law of thermodynamics. So. Uh, Energy must be conserved. It can never be created or destroyed. Uh, it can only be converted from one form to another. But that's getting into like, deep physics for me to understand. But, but it is, it is, it is a, a bedrock principle on which the whole universe operates, but in particular, houses and heatings, heating operates, which is that the energy in equals the energy out. Because you can't create energy. You can't destroy energy. You can only move it from one place to another or exchange it from one form to another. So all the energy that comes in, and a good example is, is the light bulb. The light bulb, the energy comes in as light. It comes in as electricity, but it's converted to light. That light ends up as heat in your house. That may seem a little counterintuitive, but it is true. The light you're seeing around you right now is absorbed by your body and the walls and the windows and everything. It's absorbed. When it's absorbed, it's heating up the things that absorb it. Um, and uh, so that uh, energy, that one kilowatt hour of electricity you're putting into your light bulbs is ending up as heat in your house. And that's one kilowatt hour of heat your heating system doesn't need to create. So the way the energy model works, I look first at the, at the electricity consumption, because I know every kilowatt hour of electricity you're using is going to end up as heat somehow, with the possible exception of what Scott said with um, hot water running out the, out the drain. But other than that, as an exception, Every kilowatt hour of electricity you use is going to produce a kilowatt hour of heat in your house. And what, what balances it then, what brings it up to 70 degrees in your house or whatever your thermostat temperature is, is the heating oil or the, or the natural gas, the heating fuel that you use. And that's how the energy model works. It first assumes that your heat comes from electricity, whatever electricity you're using. And then the balance item is the amount of heating fuel you use to get your house to whatever your thermostat is set at. Um, but that, that fundamental principle does, does, does underlie this, that all energy that goes in must eventually go out. And, and because those two are equal, we know what the energy going in is. It's the number of kilowatt hours on your electric bill, and it's the number of BTUs on your natural gas or heating oil bill, which we then convert to kilowatt hours just so they're in the same units. We can add them all up. Um, but we know the amount of energy going in. So therefore, we know what the energy loss is. It's the same number. And that is what allows us to calibrate the model up front and say, we know that this model is reasonably accurate because it predicts your current energy bill. And only then, and only then, we start to move on to changes in your thermal envelope, as Scott describes it, your windows, your walls, your attic, your basement. Um, and, uh, and then we can calculate, because we now know the energy savings, we can calculate the cost savings, and that allows us to do the discounted cash flow analysis and calculate the net present value in the IRR. Um, okay, does that, um, any, any further questions 
on that? Okay, all right. Hopefully we've uh, done enough then. If everyone, anyone does have any other questions, please call me or email me. I know um, who wasn't here last time, Karen and Cindy, I think, Karen and Colleen. So if you guys have questions from, did you watch the, the video? Uh, I got halfway through it. Halfway through it. Colleen? Yeah, so. I didn't finish it either. Okay. Um, so if you've got any questions, yep. um, please email me or, if, or if, if you guys want to spend some extra time together to go over concepts and stuff, I'm happy to do it. Okay, yep. so let me know if you want sort of any, any kind of catch up. Okay, so I think what we should do now is um, go into the breakout group, group, groups because we didn't do we didn't do this last time because we were um, uh, spent so much time on the financial stuff. Um, and uh, the, 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 the goal of this then is to spend 15 minutes each being both the client and then the, the coach. So you just swap around halfway through. I'll remind you halfway through uh, to swap around. I want to make sure we each get time as the coach needs to get time as the client. And um, you can use that client uh, data spreadsheet to help guide you through the conversation. Because now we have some data to work on. We're no longer just dealing with concepts about heat pumps and insulation. We're no, we're no longer just dealing with concepts like um, IRR and net present value. And we're no longer just dealing with concepts like energy modeling. We've actually got some data to work on and, um, and start thinking about, well, what should this person be doing? What should your client be doing to cut their carbon footprint and, um, and, uh, and, their, and their bills? Um, Okay, so I'm going to have to sign you all the breakout rooms. Just, just take just a moment. So, so just just so I'm clear, we're just going to go over kind of what we put into our own spreadsheet, or. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so so the coach and the client should work together to go over yeah. the client's data, and start to use that to start creating a plan. Now, we're not going to be at the end of the plan yet, and hopefully, what we've done in the previous groups is to think about the questions that should be asked, the questions you need to ask in order to get to um, some actions for this particular client. Um, and now you've got some data. Now you've got so, some data. So where would we get the other person's data from? Um, so it should be in the, in the spreadsheets that, uh, I, I know I have everyone's spreadsheet now. Um, I had, I'd hope you'd all email that to Oh, we were to email it to our partner. Okay. <laughs> that was okay, sorry. Do it very quickly now, like I did. <laughs> yeah, you may have to just quick, quickly do that then. And um, so let me just remind everyone. So Cindy's with Michael, Karen's with Colleen. Hello. Hello. Hi, Karen. Welcome back. Hi, Colleen. Hello. We've solved all the world's problems. Very strange. Come on, 15 minutes is all it takes. Uh oh. Uh, Fred, are you there? I am, yes. All right, good. Um, so let me ask, how did that go? You mean like our session is three of us? Yeah, just, just, just general impressions. How did it go? Yeah, um, actually very well. I had my speech spreadsheet laid out and I think I already know what problems I have, but um, it was good to just go through them again. There's a lot of low hanging fruit in insulation. And then Katie, uh, that's interesting. She just had a mass safe audit done and we were talking about, um, and that would be a question for you, David. Uh, maybe Katie, you can elaborate. She has a solar system and it's over basically overproducing and she's exporting energy is getting checks from Eversource. And I think Katie was told that she could not use that excess energy for anything else. No, that's not quite right. What I was okay. told that my energy produced by my solar panels goes to Eversource, period. And then they send me back what I use. So if the power goes out, I need a battery. If I buy a battery and I charge a battery, then I can use that battery to power my electricity at my house. But, you know, I like to think the solar production is contributing to my energy use directly, but it doesn't, you know, it seems like it has to go to Eversource and then come back to me. That's so, so it sounds to me like maybe you're you're producing when when you send electricity out of the grid, you get a credit on your bill, 
and, and roughly it's about 20 cents per kilowatt hour. They don't give you the full 23, they give you roughly 20 cents per kilowatt hour. That's a financial credit that you can then use to offset future bills. Um, I think what they're probably saying to you is your, your energy use member source is less than the energy you're producing from your solar panel array. And those right, are but Here's the thing. If I produce energy on my roof and my power goes out, I should have energy from my roof to power my house. That is not the case. That is not the case. When the, when the grid goes out, you have no power at all, unless right. you have a battery, which you don't have. So, so you're not using those not using those credits during a power outage, you're using those credits against your future bills. And what I'm guessing, well, but yeah, what I'm guessing is happening is you're creating more solar panel credits, more solar electricity credits than you're using. Now those credits will ultimately expire unused, unless Katie, you get an electric vehicle or you get a heat pump and you start using That's exactly what I said. Unless That's what I said. <laughs> Right. This is good stuff. So, so this is, you're not the only one like this, Katie. My sister-in-law had exactly this. So she put solar panels on her roof. She'd done no energy modeling. No one had a clue what was going on in her house. And she produced more solar than she needed. Now, oh, oh, hey. never going to give her the money. They're not going to give her a check. Yes, well, they expect every month. Hey, can I, can I, can I, can I buy uh, Katie's credits? Yes, you can get it to her. You do a Schedule Z. Yeah, you can. Which is, credit you do, which is not what I am doing. Just so you know, I'm producing more, and I'm selling them to my sister. In yeah. Newton. And that's now, what, the only way to get the money back, because I put in a system that I knew is producing twice what I use. And I basically, to get it back, I say, here, you could have some fresh, fresh solar energy here, uh, but you do have to go through what's called the Schedule Z process. Yeah. And, you, and I could explain it more as to anybody who cares, but that's, Katie, if you're never gonna use them and it's gonna expire, then you well, should wait, call Schedule I, Z and sell it to I, Scott. What's the price? It's, tw it's, the, it's 23 price? cents? No, it, it's not quite 23 cents, it's about 20 cents. You don't get the no, full wait, credit, so you get most of it. Yeah. They send me a check every month for my resource. Yeah, but that's for your incentive. That's your smart bill. That, that's your smart payment key. That is part of the subsidy for your solar panels. That's the smart incentive. That is different to the net metering. So they, they are sending you a check, but it's different to the net metering. Your net metering is building up credits on your bill, which you can use against, and you can only use against future bills. It's monopoly money. You can only use it in the game of monopoly, paying your bill. You can't use it for anything else, unless you do what Michael just said, which is you use this thing called Z metering, which allows you to transfer those credits for somebody else's meter. And if you've got a friend or a sister like Michael, you can transfer and they can pay you back for the credits you've transferred to them. This, this is how community solar works. So community solar works by having, by somebody having a big field and they put lots of solar panels in and they generate tons of credits and they allocate those credits to you. You buy them, you buy those credits at a discount, 12.5%. You buy those discounts from them. So they allocate those credits to you on Z metering. Your bill goes down by that amount of credit. And then you pay the solar, the um, the community solar company at a 12.5% discount. So you save money on your on your electricity bill. Do you have to be in the same region or could somebody be across the country and do this? No, no, no it's, it's worse than that, Cindy. You have to be in the same. It's called the, the, the load zone within Eversource. So only Eversource to Eversource, only national grid to national grid. Oh, uh, uh, okay. But even, uh, even but Eversource, it, it, within Eversource's load zone, the load zone we're in runs from roughly Boston to Marlborough. So it, it's a pretty big space. So anyone within sort of 495 can transfer credits using Z metering, but you cannot transfer out of state, Cindy. You can't transfer to someone in Vermont. You can't even transfer to someone on National Grid. And you can't transfer okay. to the Berkshires. Okay. And you, you, well, can't, wait, uh, you yeah. can't get a battery when you're putting in the system so that you can store your own? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can, Nicole, but it's a totally different issue. It's totally separate from, from both the smart payments that Katie's getting from Eversource as a check once a month, which is the subsidy for solar panels. There's also a smart subsidy for batteries. So if a battery and solar panels, you get a bigger subsidy check like Katie is getting every month. 
but but that is different from net metering. It's all very complicated, but it's different from net metering where you get credits on your bill for the solar production you export to the grid. And then, and then th those credits can be sold to someone else in the same load zone with the same utility company through the Z metering process. It's all incredibly complicated. I'd be shocked if you got questions about this, but if you do, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> These things are how you get the money out of Eversource and out of uh, um, um, the, the government for the subsidies. Yeah, Katie? I have a question about this. Okay, so why do I get a different amount every month if it's a smart payment from Eversource? And were I to hook up a heat pump or a heat pump hot water a heater, um, would the would that work to use this credit you're talking about, smart credit? Yes. Uh, well, wait, 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 slowly, slowly, step by step. So the smart credit is a check sent to you by the utility company for the production of your solar panels, regardless of where you use it. Doesn't matter whether you use it or a friend uses it or you export it to the grid. It's just the production of your solar panels is the basis of that check. That check comes because you've got solar panels, Katie. If you had solar panels and a battery, you get a bigger check. The solar panel check is about eight cents per kilowatt hour you produce. If you've got a battery, you'll get an additional four cents on top, so about 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which is actually a pretty hefty subsidy. And um, I'm currently buying batteries uh, for my house and for um, our rental place. And because they're both tied in with fairly large arrays, 15 kilowatts on my house and uh, 17 kilowatts on our rental house, um, they are gonna, those batteries are gonna be almost free because that four cents battery subsidy from Smart is, is, alloc is uh, calculated on all the production, which is about 15,000 kilowatt hours a year. So I get a, a big, uh, I, I will get a big check, Katie. I don't get it today because I haven't done it yet. But when I do this, I will get a bigger check because of having that battery addition to the, um, to the solar panel production as well. What about a heat pump addition? Right, so if you had a heat pump, what will happen is your consumption of electricity will go up, your use of heating fuel will go down, but your consumption of electricity will go up, and so you have a bigger electric bill. So now, whereas those credits were building up on your bill and you're never gonna use them, they'll now be drawn down. Those credits last forever, they'll be drawn down, and uh, eventually, your, uh, your annual use of electricity will probably be higher than your annual production. And then, you won't, then you'll stop storing up credits, you'll just be using them all the time. So it's a very good idea to either Z-meter your excess to someone else. It's an even better idea to use it yourself, because then you get a full 23 cents per kilowatt hour credit. So the best thing to do with those excess solar production is either buy an EV or get a heat pump. Because right That's now, exactly you're, what I said. You're, you're, giving, you're giving that money away, Katie. That money can be used to heat your house and catch, catch your fuel. Thanks up. for confirming. Thanks for confirming, David, because I think she's the ideal candidate in Sherborne, having like a large uh, solar array. And uh, I don't know how much you spend on oil, Katie, but must be substantial with a house where you. Uh, heat several rooms that you don't inhabit. So this would be a perfect, perfect scenario. And I think David could help us to figure out how, how exactly how much money you would save by putting in an air source heat pump. And your um, emission reduction will be substantial. Yeah, because you, your electricity is going to be free to you, Katie, because you're currently just giving it away. So okay. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great Great piece of coaching and client work, you guys. You guys have got to a, a brilliant solution for a complicated situation. That's not a plain vanilla situation where someone has solar already, where someone's got excess credits. That's an unusual situation, but you've got to exactly the right solution. As congratulations. So, <laughs> David, do, do those credits expire? No, they don't. They, they they stay forever. But if you don't use them, you lose them because you're not using them. They just build up on your meter. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can Z meter them. Um, I'm not sure if you can Z meter a historical balance. I think you can only Z meter current production. Yes, but if you send enough of it off, oh, actually, I can't tell. You might but, be able to. Yeah, I can't tell if you can use them up because I was worried about that. Use so up. If I ran my extension cord over to Katie's house, I'd be doing her a favor. Exactly. <laughs> okay. You're exactly right, Katie. How you can. Away do you neighborhood. Live? I'm right next door. No. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> 
No, but, but that, that's exactly right. You got the concept exactly right. Katie's not using enough electricity and she's giving it away right now. So you need to use more electricity, Katie. And you but what are those checks they're sending me? What Sorry? is that paying me for? The check is for the smart subsidy. It's not for the net metering. What is the smart subsidy? It's the state, the state of Massachusetts subsidy for solar panels. It's a federal subsidy, which is the 26% off your tax bill. So if you if you spend $50,000, I can't do the math, $100,000, you'd have a $26,000 tax credit from the federal government against your federal taxes. Massachusetts has a $1,000 tax credit against your state taxes, but that is a small subsidy. The big subsidy is the smart subsidy. But why is Eversource sending me this money? Uh, that's the way the program is run. Eversource actually cuts the checks. But that's just the way it's run. It's just that the, 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 the state government would rather have Eversource sign the checks than have the state treasurer sign the checks because then it's off the budget and maybe the voters won't notice. Mm -hmm. okay. So just to repeat that, currently it's it's not a physical a check that she can uh, cash. It's basically just a credit that shows up on her um, meter. But yeah. She sees it physically in a shake. So it is, she really has to think about how she can use that credit. Yeah. So you're right, Dorothea. The smart subsidy comes as a check every month for 10 years from the date of installing the solar panels. Mm -hmm. the, um, the net metering builds up on your, on your bill. And if you don't use it, 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 will, it won't expire, but you just never use it. It'll just be there until you sell the house. Okay. I think. That makes sense for me to go with the heat. Absolutely. Okay, let's, let's get there. Let's not jump to conclusions, but you're heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, well, the best way is to plug in all, um, basically, the energy in the financial model, in the client questionnaire, all of these kind of like uh, inputs so that David can calculate how much you will be saving. And I would be surprised um, if the air source heat pump has a very short payback period. I, I'm, I'm guessing you're right, Dorothea, but yeah. let's run the numbers and find out. That's the purpose of the energy modeling is to yeah. numbers these ideas, but, but this is the right concept. It's absolutely the right concept for this situation. Uh, okay, we've only got a couple minutes left. So, so, let me, so, so Fred, I'm just gonna, uh, can you give us just like a, a, a brief intro to, to what we're gonna be doing next week? Good question. Uh, yes, I can. Um, <laughs> we're going to switch gears a little bit and look at um, the whole issue of consulting with clients. And uh, we'll look at a couple of tools. Uh, we're we're going to keep it fairly simple and fairly straightforward. But look at a couple of tools that are, uh, I have found in my career incredibly useful for working with clients. Um, thing, we'll, we'll get there. But at any rate, uh, we'll, we'll cover three tools <clears throat> and a couple of concepts. And honestly, um, these things are, are so simple and so straightforward that they're immediately implementable. Um, but they might not be something you've thought about before. So that's what we're going to offer is just some ideas about how do I consult? How do I you know, we're not going to talk about active listening, but active listening is in the background. But we'll talk about a couple of tools that can help you work with clients when, especially when they don't know what they're thinking. Um, you know, I want solar panels. Well, why? You know, what's the point? Where, where are you going with that? And is that the right idea? Um, just because you latched onto it. So uh, we'll look at that. And um, there's actually no pre-work for it so we're just going to show up and do it okay so 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 we've everyone's sort of got a week off except me because i'm going to be doing all the energy modeling for all of you guys which is more work than i thought but that's okay I'll, I'll get through it um and so hopefully by next week i'll be able to give you those so at least you can now have some some way to prioritize the sort of things you're talking about conceptually here for your clients but next week's session as fred says will, will not be about that It'll be about the consulting skills, and then we'll come back for the for the following one, and um, hopefully we'll then have like the final plans that we can discuss for e for each of the clients. 
Um, so that's the end of tonight's session. Thank you all for coming. It was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And um, I will see you all next week. Okay. Thank you, David. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.